Um, yeah, if you have your Bibles, hopefully you're to the end of Mark chapter 2 right now. And uh, the book of Mark is really helping us answer the most important question that we're going to ever have to answer uh, in this life. And it's the question that Jesus asked his disciples in chapter 8 when he turns around and looks at them and he says, Who do you say that I am? And by extension, Grace Bible, that's the question to you too. Who do you say that this Jesus is? You may choose throughout your life to ignore the question. You may choose to answer it based on how you feel it should be answered. Or you may choose to answer it according to the way the Word of God tells us what the answer is. Um, But ultimately, how we respond to that one question of who you say Jesus is will affect everything for everything. All of eternity, all of your right now. Everything. That's why the book of Mark is a place that we really want to take our time rolling through to understand who this Jesus is so that we don't walk away with this cultural version of who, of Jesus in our mind being who we want him to be, but we can learn about who he really is. And I, I can assure you, Grace Bible, when you meet the Jesus that is of the word of God, the Jesus that introduced himself in flesh and in word, he is greater than we could ever ask or imagine. Not the greater version of what you hope Jesus to be, but greater than you could ever ask or imagine. He is beautiful and he is wonderful and there is none like him and there is none before him. There is none above him. He is the king of all kings and he's the Lord of all lords and he is God. And he's the one who is worthy of ruling and reigning over our lives. And his preferences are worthy of ruling and reigning over our preferences. His life and his ministry and his continued life in us through the Holy Spirit is worthy of us laying our lives down and submitting to him. Not, not bowing our hearts before the little G gods of this age, even though they offer greater comfort at times. Because they want to feed and meet the needs and the longings that we think we have. Jesus is there to meet the deepest and greatest needs in us. He is an all-sufficient king. He's everything that we could ever need and then some. But we need to learn him for who he is so we can truly answer the question with conviction, who is it that we say that he is? Now, Jesus, throughout the last several weeks as we've been following his life, just through the first couple of chapters, like, he he has risen to some unwanted but unavoidable celebrity status as he's been traveling from town to town throughout Galilee preaching the word of God. Um, It kind of happens when you start performing supernatural miracles. Um, You know, when lepers start getting healed and crippled people start walking and many, 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 they don't even list all of the things that Jesus did in healing these people traveling from town to town. When that starts happening, crowds start showing up. Not because they're followers of Jesus, but because either A, they're hoping that he'll do for them what he did for the other people, or B, they just wanted a front row seat to the show. But his celebrity status was through the roof. And everything was all well and good. I mean, even the religious leaders were okay, and they were just standing in the crowd watching it happen until this last miracle we talked about last week when Jesus looked at the leper, you know, the one that, uh, not the leper, the crippled man, when they dug the hole in the roof and they lowered the guy down so that he could be close to Jesus. And Jesus, instead of healing his legs, Jesus forgave his sin. And then everybody was astonished, and the religious leaders are looking at him like, who are you to claim to forgive sin? Only God can forgive sin. What was Jesus claiming to be? God, who do you say that he is, Grace Bible? He claims to be God. He claims to have the authority over sin. And then he tells the religious leaders that were sitting in the room, he said, just so you know that I do have authority to forgive sin, I say to you, crippled man, stand up, grab your mat, and walk. And he did. They believed Jesus to be a blasphemer at that point until they saw that extraordinary miracle. But yet now they're very uncomfortable with the authority and the influence that Jesus has in the communities where they were the ultimate religious authority. Now people are flocking to Jesus. And this sets the religious leaders on edge. But Jesus finally pushes them over the edge this week toward the end of chapter 2, talking about something that we don't really have a big understanding of in this time, in this culture, so I'll do my best to kind of weave it into our lives, but ultimately hang around as I get through that till we get to the end when I really start talking about why Jesus was doing what he was doing right here. So we pick up in chapter 2, verse 23, and it says, on the Sabbath, say Sabbath, 
Yeah, on the Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields with the disciples. They were traveling from town to town as Jesus was ministering the word of God, as Jesus was meeting the needs of the people in those towns. Not everybody, but some of them as he had opportunity. And understand, Sabbath was a deeply religious tradition, especially for ancient Jews in these ancient of times. Like, remember, Sabbath is even one of the Ten Commandments. It says, thou shalt keep the Sabbath day what? Holy, which means to keep it set apart, meaning it shouldn't be like any of the other days of your life. It is meant to be set apart for the reasons and the purposes that God gave it to us for. Sabbath was very central to the life and religion of those who were walking with God at that particular time, as it should be important to us and central to our lives at this time, but I'll get to that in just a second. Now, God kind of, not only did he command Sabbath from his people under the old covenant, to keep the Sabbath day holy, but he also modeled it. Remember, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and on day one, day two, three, four, five, and six, he created, and then on day seven, he what? He rested, he Sabbathed. All right, that that word Sabbath is kind of a synonym. Some of you have heard of the ancient Hebrew word shalom, which means deep rest, deep peace. And Sabbath is kind of a synonym for that. It's an idea of deep rest and deep peace. Hello, how are you doing? Um... And it's not just about stopping your work. Sabbath is a lot more than just taking a day off. Sabbath is about the deep rest and deep peace of learning to be satisfied in what has happened. You know, if you were an ancient Hebrew person reading the account of Genesis chapter 1 and 2, watching God create the heavens and the earth and everything in it, you would be reading those words, stepping back, saying, man, it looks like God's building a house for himself or a temple. And you would really have been convinced that God was building a temple for himself after day six and he had finished all creation, that it said he rested. To them, that he Sabbath means he sat down to rule and reign, like he moved into the house. That's what it would have meant to them. When they see God rest, Sabbath, on the seventh day, they get a picture of God moving into a temple that he just built for himself, seated on a throne at perfect peace, being satisfied and delighting in everything that he has done as he rules over it. Sabbath was meant to be the same thing for us. Sabbath wasn't just a day that we religiously rhythm into our lives to take a day off because God told us to because we need to show up to church. No, Sabbath was meant to be a time in the life of of a believer. It was a gift from God that we would stop what we were doing rhythmically, systematically in our lives, not to just rest from work, but to sit down and take pleasure in what God had been doing to reconnect ourselves with him and the other body of believers as we celebrate the work that God is doing in our lives. That's why we gather together on Sundays, which is kind of the new covenant Sabbath day, if you will. We gather together to celebrate God, to be reminded of his faithfulness and his worthiness. And we gather together because not everybody walked in here at 100%. We needed one another. Somebody in, the, somebody in their time of rest needed to be cared for and ministered to, and it can only happen when we gather together. And so even though it's not a new covenant requirement, it is also, it's a, it's, a, it's a principle of God that predates even the old covenant because God modeled for us Sabbath rest to take pleasure in what he's been doing, which brings up the question, just on an aside, not that it really matters. I have people ask me from time to time, why is it that most Christians now gather together on Sundays instead of Saturdays because Saturday was the Sabbath day and there are some groups that, you know, claim to be a part of the Christian family that still gather together on Saturdays. Why is that? Why do we get together on Sundays? And my explanation for that is just very simple. Like, like we have been invited into a relationship with God through the Savior Jesus, who came and lived a life that none of us could live, died a death that we all deserve, and on Sunday morning rose again to defeat all of our greatest enemies, sin, Satan, and death itself. And so we gather together on Sundays as a resurrected people to celebrate the resurrection of our King. What better day to do it? You know what I'm saying? Every Sunday we gather together to look back over our shoulder and be reminded of his goodness and his power and his authority. To be reminded for those that are in need this morning that he is still a resurrected King in those hardships you're dealing with. Those of you that came in celebrating to be reminded he's the one that caused the things worthy of celebrating. This is the resurrected king at work in our lives still today through the power of his Holy Spirit. 
And so on the Sabbath day, though, back in their day, under the old covenant, they were going through the grain fields, traveling from town to town, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. They needed a snack. That's all that means. They were walking, they got hungry, and so they just started popping off the heads of the grain and just chewing on it while they were walking along the way. But because the Pharisees were watching Jesus like a hawk now and they didn't like him, they started saying to him, look at what they are doing, doing this thing that is not lawful on the Sabbath. See, the problem here is, Grace Bible, listen, it was lawful while you were traveling to pluck heads of grain to have a snack on the Sabbath. Deuteronomy 23 taught us that. But the reality is, like every other good thing God gave us, religious people got their fingers into it and started creating all these man-made laws around it that they even forgot what the original law was. Y'all ever been a part of that before? Man, church people, we love to make up rules. And we love to make you feel bad about yourself. Because if you don't feel bad enough about what you've done, we like to help. It's part of what we do. Man, they were doing it then. We do it now. It's messed up. These religious people had created so many rules around the law of God that they started to believe their own rules preceded and exceeded the law of God. And they were wrong, as we often are, as we always are when we meddle in the good things of God. See, God gave them Sabbath as, as a good thing to refresh them, to restore them, to invite them, to, to remind. It's, it's too easy to get busy with work, ain't it, and life. We just kind of forget the importance of Sabbath rest. I'm not just talking about taking a day off. I'm talking about Sabbath rest where we recommune with God, we recommune with the body of believers, where we sit back and enjoy just the work that God is doing, like true, pleasurable, salome, Sabbath rest. Well, God knew that. That's why he gave it to us as a rhythm. That's why he made it a law. It's for our good. Not just to have one more rule to follow, but the Pharisees started creating rules around it. And Jesus' response, while he could have just quoted Deuteronomy 23 to tell them they were wrong, he actually reaches back into history and he reminds them of a story that happened in the life of David because Jesus wasn't just trying to teach on Sabbath. Matter, Matter of fact, he's not teaching on Sabbath at all. Sabbath is just the object lesson. He's really talking about religion as a whole, and this is how he addresses it. This is going to make no sense to most of us, so I'm going to try to weave it. I'm going to make sense of it, and then we'll step back and look at the principle. Jesus grabs hold of this deeply Hebrew moment uh, in the life of King David, and he said to them, Have you ever read, verse 25, what, what David did when he was in need and he was hungry? And so he and those who were with him as well, and how he entered into the house of God in the time of Abiathar, I think I said that wrong, the high priest, and he ate the bread of the presence. Some of you that have studied tabernacle, a temple, we're talking about the show bread, it's also called, the bread of the presence. They ate it, which is not lawful for anyone but priests to eat, and also he gave it to those who were with them. Now, the show bread or the bread of the presence, just so you know, if, if you walked into the temple, Uh, or the tabernacle, there would be 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel that it would be out on display, the show bread or the bread of the presence, all right? And it would be there for a week, and they would replace it with fresh bread every week. And then the priests would eat the week old bread. How would you like that job? But what happened here is like, it's only lawful for priests to eat this bread, but David, you can read about this in 1 Samuel chapter 21, David and his buddies were running from King Saul. Saul was trying to kill David. David's popularity had been soaring through the roof. Saul felt threatened by it. Saul's trying to kill David. David and his boys are on the run. They see a tabernacle, and they're like, hey, man, let's go over there and ask the priest if he's got something to eat. Thinking he had something in the stores, the priest said, well, we don't have any food, but we do have this show bread. I was about to put fresh bread out. I'll give you all some of this old bread that I was going to have to eat. I'd rather you all eat it anyway. So here it is. And that's what happened. It was against the law. Only priests were allowed to eat the showbread. But God never condemns that behavior because the priest was just meeting a need that David and his boys had, even though it meant that he was having to overstep this old covenant law. The whole point of that, Jesus summarizes it in this. If you checked out, check back in, verse 27. And so Jesus says to them after telling that story, listen, Grace Bible, Sabbath was made for man. 
not man for the Sabbath. Let that resonate in your dome for just a second. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Man, there's a big principle in that. In other words, Jesus said this deeply, this deeply held religious tradition that it was given by God himself for us. It was a good thing meant for us. Don't miss the point of why God gave it. He gave it to us for us, for our good, for his glory, that we might be nourished and revitalized and transformed and healed during the Sabbath, that we might reconnect our lives with him. It wasn't the other way around. God didn't create the Sabbath just to add one more burdensome law on our shoulders. The Pharisees had long forgot that, and then Jesus goes on to say, These staggering words that don't mean a whole lot to us, but it would have rattled their cages. He says, so the man, so the son of man is Lord of not just disease, not just the mind, not just leprosy, not just sin. The son of man, Jesus, is Lord even of the Sabbath. I mentioned before, Jesus wasn't just pushing back on Sabbath rest, on the design of Sabbath. Jesus was pushing back on religion itself. Now the Pharisees were really watching like a hawk because what Jesus just told us right here is that he's not just somebody who showed up trying to create religious reform. He just said right here he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He just declared, I'm not here for religious reform. I'm here to put religion to death and replace it with myself. Huh? Religion was all they knew. The most spiritual people that they knew were deeply religious people. Those things kind of went hand in hand. And here Jesus is plucking heads of grain on the Sabbath. Here it is in this next section. A man shows up in chapter 3. Jesus enters the synagogue again with his disciples and he sees this guy with a withered hand and so they the religious people they're now watching Jesus like a hawk to see whether or not he was going to heal the guy on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him again and he said to the man with the withered hand come here and then he turned to them the religious people and said to them the Pharisees now let me just ask y'all before I do this is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm to save a life or to kill but they were very 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 silent And he looked around at them with anger, say anger, grieved at the, why was he so mad? At the hardness of their heart. And said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians, the followers of King Herod, held counsel against him and tried to start planning on how to destroy or how to kill Jesus. This is when it all started right here. Because Jesus said, I'm not just coming into reform religion, I'm here to put it to death and replace it with myself. Religion had taken people off the rails, so they were missing God. They didn't know who God was. They just knew what the rules were. And there was this assumption, this illusion that whoever followed the rules best knew God the best. Those things are mutually exclusive. Oh, and not just for them then, but for us now. You know, things had gone so off the rails. God had given them a law, a law that was meant to be followed as a part of the old covenant, a law that helped protect them and meet their needs and nourish their relationship with him and other people. That's what the whole Ten Commandments even is all about. The first five are about you and God, and the other five are about you and everybody else in your life. And every law after that, that was the purpose, nourishing your relationship with God, nourishing your relationship with other people, but just like Men like to do when God gives us something good and we start meddling in it, we start building fences of extra rules and regulations around it, trying to protect people into doing the right thing. But what happens is when you build fences around fruit, fruit doesn't get a chance to grow. They were missing the whole point. You know, they had so many laws of what you could not do on the Sabbath, 39 of them, very specific laws of what you could not do on the Sabbath. 
One law is easy and understandable. Okay, you don't go harvest grain for the purpose of profit. You don't go to work on the Sabbath day. We kind of get that idea. That day was meant to be holy and set apart for the purpose of worshiping the Lord, taking pleasure in what he has done. But there was also a whole bunch of other rules that were, well, let me give you an example. Today in this humid place, this peninsula of land that we live on called Florida, you're going to walk outside this door. And if you truly wanted to honor the laws of the Sabbath, one of the laws you have to maintain is that if a gnat lands on your face, and I do mean a good gnat lands on your face, To honor the Sabbath, according to the traditions of men here, you could not swat at the gannat. That's work. You could only remove it. I use this example from time to time because it's just so heinous, you know what I'm saying? You can't swat at the gnat. The only way for you to honor the Sabbath and remove the gnat is you have to do it with your thumb and your index finger. Good luck, sucker. That's going to be a lot of work. You see how off the rails we get when we start creating rules around the things that God. Sabbath was meant for our rest and our revitalization and to nourish our love with the Lord. And now we're like making people remove gnats with their index finger and their thumb. Have you lost it? We always do. We always create extra rules and extra laws. That's religion. That's why Jesus was so angry when he looked at the Pharisees, when he's about to heal this man's withered hand, I asked him, why was he so angry? But Tim Keller put it like this. Jesus was so angry about these religious leaders after he had just said that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, because the Sabbath is about restoring the diminished. It's about replenishing the drained. It's about repairing the broken. To heal a man's shriveled hand is to do exactly what the Sabbath was all about. The hearts of the religious leaders are as shriveled as the man's hand. They're insecure and anxious about the regulations. They're tribal, judgmental, and self-obsessed instead of caring about the man. Why? One word. Religion. This whole section of Scripture, the end of 2 and 3, really has very little to do about the Sabbath and everything to do about Jesus bringing religion to an end and replacing it with himself, a relationship with God. You know, most people in the world, believe it or not, Grace Bible, most people in the world, there are, there are atheists, obviously, out there and maybe even among us this morning, but most people in the world believe that there is a God and of some kind, and most people also believe that the way that you best associate with that God, whichever God it is that these people believe in, the way that we best associate with him and identify with him is through good behavior of some kind, some sort of performance or good behavior. That's every religion in the world, all right? Now, as we look at kind of the grand scope of religion itself around the world, every religion in the world except for one falls into one of three categories, all right? Category number one, all right, in no particular order, uh, many of the religions of the world are nationalistic, all right? Nationalistic means that you get to God by becoming one of us, You get to God by becoming one of us. You take on kind of our identity, our markers, our way of looking at things around the world. Like, and once you take on our identity, then you are made right with God by becoming one of us. Uh, We see a lot of nationalism kind of pop out around political times because we hear people, you know, kind of representing their political party saying, well, if you're really a Christian, then you would vote this way. That's nationalistic. It's like If you become one of us, then you're right with God. And they kind of boil it down to those constructs, all right? There's also spiritualistic. Many religions in the world fall into a spiritualistic category. And it's the idea that you get to God by going through certain transformations of your consciousness, all right? Many religions in the world believe in this. Uh, You know, it's just kind of this elevations of consciousness and understanding. Uh, We see it in the, you know, in the Christian world in ways of, you know, uh, you know, folks will say, well, you're not really uh, a Christian if you don't worship this certain way. Or you're not really a Christian if you haven't received this certain spiritual gift yet. That's spiritual, all right, spiritualistic uh, religion. Uh, Last but not least, some of you guys are probably familiar with this, being in the Bible Belt Southeast, many of the religions in the world would also potentially fall into legalistic religion. Uh, You get to God by following a certain code of conduct, You kind of understand that. 
um, certain behavior pattern that you have to adopt into your life if you're going to follow God. Now, my question for us this morning um, is which one of these does Christianity fall into? Like, I mean, the true gospel, all right, I know I gave some examples of stuff, but like, which one of these does Jesus-endorsed gospel Christianity fall into, or which ones of these does Jesus-endorsed gospel Christianity fall into? Nationalistic, spiritualistic, legalistic. None of them. None of them. What's interesting, though, is I could rattle off example after example of how in Christianity we, and I could talk about nationalistic things that we believe, and I could talk about spiritualistic things we believe, and I could talk about legalistic things that we believe, but the reality of it is Jesus-endorsed gospel Christianity doesn't fit into any of those categories at all. It's actually the opposite. It's the one religion in the world that is nothing like the rest of them. Every one of those religions has the same logic. If I perform, if I obey, then I am accepted, right? Many of us have seen Christianity that way. Christianity is the opposite of that. As a matter of fact, Romans 5.8 says, God proved his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, while we were still in our sin, Christ died for us. Every religion in the world says, if I perform, if I obey, then I am accepted. But just in that one passage, and I'll give you another one here in a second, the one true God says the opposite. He says, even though you didn't perform, and even though you didn't obey, I still came to make a way for you. Every religion in the world sees God as a ladder to climb to be able to ascend to his favor. There's things that you have to do in order to get to the level that he's called you to if you want the favor of God in your life, if you want to be his. Every religion in the world, you have to climb the ladder to get to God. But gospel Christianity, God walked down the ladder to get to us. You see the difference? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God did it to prove his love for us. Every religion in the world is working to earn the favor of God. Gospel Christianity, what Jesus endorsed and taught, is that those who believe in him get to work from the favor of God. This is, just so you know, I'm not just coming up with this stuff. Here's one of the many passages of scripture that talk about it. One of my favorites, this page in my Bible is worn out. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. Listen, Grace Bible, for it is by grace that you have been saved. For those of you that believe in Jesus Christ and Lord is, is Lord and King, who've been forgiven of your sins, who've been invited into the family of God, who have heaven as your eternal promise to be with him once and for all, forever. It says it was by grace that you got that salvation. Through faith. And this is not of your own doing, by the way. Let me clear that up for you. The grace of God was not of your own doing, and the faith that you had in the grace of God was not of your own doing either, just to double it up on you. This is a double stuff Oreo right here. You couldn't conjure up the faith on your own. Romans 8 specifically and other places in the scripture speak of faith itself even as a gift from God. You want to talk about God being madly in love with you? It was through his grace that you even had the option of getting saved. And it was him giving you the faith so that you would run after him. You want, he's crazy about you. He longs to be in relationship with you. This isn't you trying to figure out a way to get to him. This is him pulling out all the stops to get to you. All the stops. There was no distance he wouldn't travel. No place too far, no place too dark, no sinner too wretched that Jesus wouldn't get off the throne of heaven to run hard and fast after us, that we might know that he is the one true king. It's by grace you have been saved through faith, and it is, this is not of your own doing. It's a gift from God. It's not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. No one can boast in receiving the grace of God because you did nothing to get it, No one can boast in having a greater faith than somebody else because you did nothing to earn it. You merely stepped into the batter's box. He delivered the pitch and he hit it. Some of y'all didn't catch that. That was a baseball analogy for some of y'all. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, which answers the question, well, Dustin, like, 
aren't we supposed to obey the word of God too? Aren't we supposed to obey God and walk faithfully with him? Yes, yes, yes. But it's the opposite of everything that I was ever taught in my life. I heard my pastor preach over and over again, there's freedom in Christ Jesus. And I was sitting out there as a teenage kid saying, no, there's not. Like, I want Jesus. I want his forgiveness. I want to honor him with my life. But in order to be able to walk that tightrope, there's nothing free about it. Because it's rules after rules after rules and regulations, and it's like suffocating to be a Christian. I misunderstood the gospel. And maybe he did too. The reality of it is we see there in Ephesians chapter 2 amongst many other places in the scripture, the Christian gospel, the word of God, doesn't say that we work so that we may be accepted by God, but it says because we have been accepted, therefore we work, therefore we obey. You know why? Because you can't help yourself. If you've accepted and realized the real grace of Jesus Christ and his real love for you, you cannot help but want to honor him with your life. It's, there's, there's no room for religion or regulation because you just don't care about that. You've been so loved and so transformed by the king of glory that you just long to honor him with your life. You long to obey his word. You long to walk with him. It's, you're not doing it out of obligation. You're doing it because of motivation. You've been just, man, you can't help yourself. You long for it. You don't do it perfectly all the time, but we don't work for the grace and acceptance of God. That's religion. We get to work from the grace and acceptance of God. That's the gospel. Religion is obligation. The gospel is motivation. This is what Jesus is getting at here. Let let me put practical boots on this before we wrap up our time together and give you some practical, real-life things in your story of why The gospel always overpowers and exceeds religion. And I bet if you see yourself in the religion category, here's an opportunity for you this morning, Grace Bible, to be set free by the good news of the gospel today. All right? I'm going to look at it at my phone while you have it up on the screen. The primary message of religion, we just talked about it. The primary message of every religion in the world, salvation is earned based on what you do for God. That's religion. I felt that way most of my life. But the gospel teaches that salvation is a free gift based on what God has done for you. We just talked about that in Ephesians 2. One of many places. What about when it comes to obedience? We know that obedience to God is important in the Christian life. But it's the opposite of the way I was told growing up. I'm not obeying God to try to earn his favor. I'm obeying God because of his favor in my life already. Religion says I begrudgingly obey God because I have to earn his acceptance. And low-key, I kind of resent God for it. I did. When I was steeped in religion, like, I was low-key kind of mad that, like, this Christian life, this is horrible. Man, I feel suffocated by this. I told you a little bit of my story, and it's because, like, I begrudgingly had to obey God because I didn't want to step out of line. I saw God as a kid on an anthill with a magnifying glass. I didn't see God as the lover of my soul. Because the gospel teaches that I gladly obey God because I have freely received his acceptance and I delight in honoring God. And I want to do it, honestly. I just, I just, now I just want to honor God. I do a pretty poor job a lot of days, but like, there's something in me that just longs to want to honor God with my life. It's different now that the gospel is taking hold. What about your relationship to God? Now religion, I bet somebody came in here this morning and falls in this category. I'm always uncertain about my right standing before God. I don't know if I'm good with him or not good with him. Because I never know if I've done enough to please God. The result is anxiety and insecurity. And quite frankly, I'm afraid of God. Because you're trying to work your way into his favor. But the gospel doesn't teach that. The gospel says I can always be certain of my right standing before God. Because Jesus has already done enough for God to be pleased with me. It is by his righteousness that I've been healed. It is by his stripes that I have been healed. It is by his death on the cross that my sins had been forgiven. It is by his resurrection that I have hope of a new life. You get that? It's the gospel. That's good news. That's why we call it good, really good news. How about your relationship with other, uh, now how about your view of yourself? And we'll get into other folks here in a sec. My self view is consistently changing because it's based on how well I do at any given moment. And when I do poorly, I despair. And when I do well, I get prideful. Boy, look at me. That's religion. It ain't about you. The gospel 
is about Jesus. He replaced religion with himself, and he says, my self-view stays grounded in the fact that my value is based on what Jesus has already done for me. When I do poorly, I am humbled because I'm reminded of my need for a Savior. But I do not despair because I have an all-sufficient Savior, and when I do well, I am grateful because God is at work in my life. But I'm not prideful because it is more God's work than my work. Yeah, that's good news, ain't it? That's the gospel. Who do you say this Jesus is? I want to make sure you know the right one. What about your view of others? <laughs> you religious folk who don't truly understand the gospel or the real Jesus of the Bible, my, your identity is based on what you accomplish and how moral you are. I judge people who are, quote, worse than me, and I am jealous of people who are, quote, better than me. But the gospel teaches, since my identity is based on what Jesus accomplished for me and how moral he was, I sympathize when people who are, quote, worse than me because I, I need a savior just as much as they do. And I celebrate with those who are, quote, better than me because their lives honor the savior that I love. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, I celebrate with other people when God is doing something special in their lives. And that's it. Probably good because we're out of time. Listen, we'd love to pray with you and talk with you more about this. I know some of you are sitting here this morning probably confused, slap out of your mind. Because if you're anything like me, every bit of Bible teaching that you ever heard was just the Pharisees slinging law at you, creating more rules and regulations so that you would leave trying to figure out how to be a better Christian. What the good news of the gospel is, is you can't pull it off on your own. And nor did he expect you to. That's why Galatians 5.22 says that he plans to produce in you the fruit of the Spirit. It's the Spirit of the living God at work in your life that is going to will and to do and to work all this stuff in you. Our job, step in the batter's box. We yield to the work of the Lord. That's why we believe that discipleship is learning, learning to let the leadership of Jesus take control of all the areas of our life. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord, I pray uh, for this church family, these people in this room, that you might so saturate their hearts with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that the lie of religion that is the devil's religion, Lord, that you would cast it aside, that you would clear up the view of our eyes and our hearts. Lord, that we would see clearly the work of Jesus, that it might motivate us, as Ephesians 2.10 says, that because of our salvation, we work and we serve, and we obey, and we do it because we delight in it. And there's nothing that we would rather do than honor you with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.